When it comes to you, what do you think is most important to God? Seriously, pause this video for a second and think about it. When it comes to you, what do you think is most important to God? What did you come up with? That you're a good person, that you do your best in whatever you're doing, that you're nice and fair to other people. How about that you're happy? Do you think God is most concerned that you're happy and feel good about yourself? That you're successful? Or maybe it's that God doesn't want you to have problems, and if there are some, that God will step in and take care of them. Wrong! Wrong, 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 wrong. God bless the Corinthians. In the New Testament, we have two different letters written to the church in Corinth from the Apostle Paul. Corinth was a very popular place in biblical times, kind of like New York City. A lot of people came from a lot of different places and lived there. And because of that, there were a lot of different ideas about the best ways to live. In Paul's two letters, he tried to help the Corinthians understand the ways that God has called us to live. A good bit of his words were about helping people to learn what we learned in our last lesson, that we have been built by God to serve others. But the Corinthians still seemed to be more concerned about themselves. The Corinthians seemed to think that the point of being Christian was to just be happy and feel good. And when Paul corrects them, they basically throw a temper tantrum and they start attacking him. It makes sense, right? When I feel like I'm doing my best and someone tells me I'm doing something wrong, I get ticked. Same thing, I think. So in the second letter, Paul has to do some extra work to make sure the Corinthians know that even though they might not totally get what being a Christian is about, there's no need to worry. God still loves them. He basically says, look, this is all a work in progress. I'm correcting you because I love you, not to make you feel bad. I want you to understand what being a Christian is all about because it's really great. I think Paul had to learn a hard lesson that if you're going to correct someone, you have to first make sure they know they're not going to get punished if they do it wrong for a while. It's a learning curve, and sometimes people get scared about doing things they're not good at. So even though the Corinthians were being nasty and mean, it's probably that they were just scared that God wasn't going to love them anymore. So Paul reminds them that God has already chosen them. The phrase he uses is, in Christ. He says, for if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Paul makes sure that his readers understand that through the work of Jesus Christ, all relationships with God are being made right. The fancy theological word is reconciliation. We are all being reconciled to God. And as Paul points out, in doing this, God ignores our sin and doesn't hold it against us. Ask the pastor. My friends ask me if I've ever been saved. What are they talking about? What should I tell them? Well, lots of times, again, people think that salvation is about something that we do. And so they're going to say, when, you know, when were you saved? When did you claim Jesus? Um, when people ask me, when were you saved? I say, 2,000 years ago, when Jesus died for me. That's when I was saved. That's when all of us were saved. What am I saved from? Oh, I think we're saved from ourselves. <laughs> um, really? Um, saved from the things that separate us from God. So in some sense, I think we're safe from ourselves. All right, well, why do I need to be saved? It's not so much that you need it today, but you already were saved. And um, by being saved 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross, then you were saved from death and you were saved um, for life. It's not just being saved from something, but being saved for something. Does everybody get saved? I say yes, everybody gets saved, because if everybody was saved when Jesus died on the cross, everybody's saved. For me, if God is sovereign, if God is in charge, and God wants to save anybody, mm -hmm. who's going to stop God? Mm -hmm. Not me. There are others who would say that, well, no, some are, and some aren't. So if God wants to save everyone, and my reading of Scripture says that pretty clearly, that the God of love who repeatedly talks about 
wanting to love and save the people. Mm -hmm. I don't see God denying salvation to anyone. Well, now, if God is all-powerful, why did Jesus have to die for me to be saved? We might try to imagine a different way, but somehow it's worked. Somehow, this particular way of doing it has made an impression on people for centuries. So, I think God knew what he was doing. <laughs> I wish it didn't have to happen that way, mm -hmm. but I think God knew what he was doing. <clears throat> a lot of people are going to tell you, yes, Jesus had to die in order to be saved. Again, I think Jesus' death is more about human sinfulness and that what happened in the resurrection is the victory of God over everything that separates us from God. So that it wasn't, it wasn't the death, it was the new life. Is Jesus the only way to salvation? Jesus is our way to salvation. And I don't know of any other way. But I just said a moment ago, if God is sovereign, mm -hmm. God can save people however God wills. And if that is through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. that's how it happens. If it's through someone who has never had the opportunity to hear and witness the story of Jesus, mm -hmm. but ends up before the throne of God in heaven and looks God in the face mm -hmm. and says, you are God, and God wants to save them, mm -hmm. God can save, God can save whoever God wants. Mm -hmm. So Gerard, you haven't told us about your day yet. Anything interesting happen? Actually, yeah, it's been a great day. First, I got an A on my history test and Mike only got a B. Then, in gym class, Coach Beckwith had us play knockout, and I was the winner. Good job. I always got nervous playing that game. Never did too well. Neither did Micah. He's always bragging about how good a basketball player he is, but when it came down to it, he couldn't compete with me. Then, after school, Mike and I went to the donut shop, and I got the last chocolate sprinkle donut. Best day ever. Jeez, kid. Jeez what? I had a good day. can I be happy about it? You just sound like a jerk. That's all I'm saying. Keisha. You don't need to be hateful. Honey, what your sister is pointing out, not very well, is that you seem to be a bit happy about doing better than Micah in all these things today. Why is that such a big deal? Because Micah's the best at everything. He always gets the good stuff. He always beats me on test. He always wins the games in gym class. I'm just glad that God finally stepped in and made me a winner for a change. I was starting to get depressed. Oh, buddy. I'm glad you had a good day. I really am. But that's not exactly the way God works. But Pastor Felix said that God had a plan for my life and that God wanted me to be happy. Isn't that why God chose me? So I could be happy? Listen, God wants you to be happy. Yeah, that's true. And while good grades and donuts are great, that's not the kind of happy I think Pastor Felix was talking about. The kind of happy God wants is the kind that gives to others, not the kind that keeps things for yourself. You mean like when you gave mom the rest of your pie? It's more than that, but yes, I knew that would make her happy. It did make me happy. So you're saying I probably could have shared the donut with Micah? I think so. Huh. He was pretty mad at me for taking the last one. And after the day he apparently had, I don't blame him. I think I'm going to go get one for him before school tomorrow. Maybe he'll forgive me for being selfish. I think you're pretty selfish, Gerard. Got anything to make me like you again? When the Book of Order says that we are elected for service as well as salvation, it's making pretty clear to us that we don't have to worry about all the things that might keep us from enjoying a relationship with God. God takes care of that bit. This is a pretty important point. I know for me, a lot of times I can't really pay attention to what someone else needs because I'm too busy worrying about what I need. I remember being in middle school and high school, and I think it's fair to say that those years can suck a lot. You're learning and growing so much, trying to figure out who you are and what your place is in this world, I mean, it's stressful in ways that adults either don't remember or can't imagine. And so we do things a lot of times to just try to feel okay. Paul's point to the Corinthians is the point to us too. We're all learning and growing. We're all just trying to figure this thing out. We've just got to remember, this God of grace and love we've been talking about has chosen us. And that whatever we think we see when we look at ourselves is not at all what God sees. We may see people who are afraid of being looked at as weak or worthless, but God sees new creations. 
And so we're, while we're trying to act tough, like nothing can bother us, God is looking at people who are built with specific gifts and talents to serve the world in its brokenness and need. God wants us to realize that that's who we are, not the other thing. So when we talk about what are we being saved from, I think the answer is we're saved from all those things we do to try and feel better on our own. We can't feel better on our own. We're not built to feel better on our own. In fact, we're going to spend the rest of this series talking about how we do this thing called church together. So before we move on, let me make it as clear as possible. There is a God who created you and everything. This God loves us in spite of what we think of ourselves and what we have done. This God has chosen us and has given each of us gifts to help make the world better. And nothing is going to stop God from making that happen. And so to answer our first question, when it comes to you, the most important thing to God is you. Just you. Oh, Jesse, you're good enough. You're smart enough. People love you. You're amazing at Presbyterian polity. You might be the best Presbyterian that ever was. Certainly the prettiest Presbyterian. Doggone it, people love you. <laughs> I am certainly the prettiest Presbyterian. 